So, okay. Well, uh, we're going to talk about pilgrims tonight, since this is the week of Thanksgiving. But it's not uh, not the the, the 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 Massachusetts kind of pilgrims that we're going to talk about. Turn in your Bible to First Peter, chapter two. We're going to wrap up this series about forerunners tonight, and we're going to talk about coming out, which is what the pilgrims did from England. Uh, let's start at verse 9. I'm going to read this passage here out of 1 Peter in the New King James Version. It says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, that they may by your good works which they observe glorify God in the day of visitation. Okay, now, a lot is said there about God's intention for us. But I want to focus on Him calling us sojourners and pilgrims. Um, the word sojourner, number 3941 in Strong's Concordance, literally means to dwell alongside, or it could be uh, generally translated as uh, a, uh, a resident alien. Now, in our world here, here in Texas, we have a lot of people from south of the border that are, you might call them guest workers. I mean, they are, they are part of the infrastructure uh, of, of the world here. They are working for crews, uh, work crews. Uh, David works with some. And their citizenship status is varied, <laughs> to say the least. But so, and, and their families are not here. Their families are somewhere else. They're making their money here and they're sending it back to their families somewhere else. Well, that's a sojourner. I was a sojourner when I was in Europe studying music back in the 1970s. Now, you know, the way I did it, I, I, I went to all of their government offices and I got a, what, a carte de séjour, a sojourner's card, so that I was, you know, semi-official. But I was still, it was, I, I was not a Frenchman. I was not a French citizen. And some of them really kind of were not entirely happy that I was playing the piano at the Windsor Hotel and getting paid for it since I was not a French citizen. But hey, they weren't paying, they weren't playing at the Windsor Hotel. So, you know, why should they complain? But see, I was a sojourner. I, it was understood now, I don't know, you know, when I went over there, I wasn't sure how long I was going to stay over there. And I wasn't over there even a whole year, and God told me to come back. He had some plans for me here. And now you know the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. But point being, I was still an American, and I remember Thanksgiving Day, 1977, um, I had gotten word that the American embassy which since then the American Embassy in Nice has closed, and I'm not sure why they did that. But anyway, there was an American Embassy in Nice back in those days, and that they were going to have some special gathering, 
And so I went down there and various Americans that were living in Nice all, all showed up at the, the, the plaza in front of the American embassy and they read a proclamation from the president and they played a, a, a recording of the Star Spangled Banner. And I really teared up because it really was brought home to me. I was a stranger in a strange land. <laughs> that I was, I was not living in, in the country of my birth, and I was living in a culture where I was just, I, I didn't even really speak their language that well. I remember people telling me, well, you speak French like a three-year-old. Well, that was a miracle in <laughs> itself, because I, I didn't know any French when I went over there. I could just say, where's the bathroom? That was about all I knew how to say in French. So, and I could count to ten, maybe. Money was kind of a little bit of a problem with me over there, but um, anyway, that really brought home to me what being a sojourner was on Thanksgiving Day in 1977. Okay, but it says we Christians in this world are sojourners, just like I in Nice, France in 1977 was a sojourner. It's like we're in, we're in a, a place, we're in an environment that is not native to who we are in Christ Jesus. Now, I was able to live there, you know. I learned to speak their language enough to get along, and they were paying me French francs, and I'd go buy food with it and put gas in my moped, and I was able to function. And, you know, and I was doing a service, I guess. The people came into the hotel to have a beer, and they'd listen to me play ragtime or something. So, you know, that was that. But, you know, that wasn't home. And this world, in its current configuration, is not our home. And God doesn't want us to feel that it is. And that's why he says here, we are sojourners. And it also says we're pilgrims. That's number 3927. And a pilgrim means almost the same thing. It means that you are, um, that you have made a home in some place other than where you came from. Yeah, I had a little loft off of Rue Simiez in Nice, and so that was, you know, my address for a while. So I, I, I was a pilgrim there, and I was there because I wanted to study music at this conservatory. I don't know why I thought that would be better than the University of Texas, but I guess I did. So anyway, uh, so I made a home there for a while. And, you know, we, uh, our parents brought us into this world here in America, and so we called this our home. But we're pilgrims. And the idea of the pilgrims going to Massachusetts was they left England because they, they did not believe they were able to practice their faith freely with, with the way the government in England, the demands that the government in England was making upon them. And we are seeing increasingly that the governments of this world are putting demands on the people of this world that are incompatible with our faith. So we are seeing... Uh, a situation like, in some ways, like what the Puritans saw back in the 1600s that made them cross the ocean blue to come over here. And the um, thing is, there's really not going to be any place on this globe that we can run to from here. I mean, it's, it's worldwide. I was hearing today that, that in New Zealand... Um, you, you, can't, uh, you can't even go into a restaurant if you haven't been vaccinated. And that they say 88% of the people in New Zealand have been vaccinated and they're pushing for 100%. And that's, that's over across the Pacific Ocean somewhere. Uh, you know, where, where are you going to run to on this planet? Well, we're going to run to Jesus is what we're going to do because it's not, there's not a geographical location that we can go to to, to get away from the devil. Because he is the prince of the power of the air. He is the ruler of this present darkness. He, the whole of planet earth is currently under his supervision and control. Now that's not going to go on forever. Anyway, go keep the place in First Peter 
and go to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 1. John the Baptist had an assignment that is similar to ours. That's what this series about forerunners has been about, is that he was to prepare the way for the, the first coming of Jesus, and Jesus is coming back a second time, and we're here ahead of that to prepare the way for his second coming. So that's why... That, we're looking at John the Baptist that way. It's not that how things ended up with him is how they're going to end up with us. Because he ended up getting his head cut off. And I don't believe God wants that to happen to us. But we should see, I'll tell you what. We should look at it at least this way. That he had a dangerous assignment and we have a dangerous assignment. That he, he, uh, was, he was in a, a, a hostile environment and we are in a hostile environment. You know, I, this is an unenviable task to, to, uh, to sit in the role of, of a Christian leader and to tell my brothers and sisters in Christ, the truth about the way things are. I mean, you all, you're adults, you can, you can do your own research. You can go on the internet or you can pray, you can ask the Holy Spirit, you can read the Bible, you can find these things out for yourself. But at the same time, I, I'm, I'm sensing a, a, an unction from the Holy Spirit to, to give a solemn warning about the way things are in this world right now because you're not really going to get that out there. In fact, you're not going to get that at a lot of churches. You're not going to get that at a lot of spirit-filled churches. You know, you're going to get something to make you feel good and at peace with God, okay? I'm not saying you shouldn't be at peace with God or even at peace within yourself. I mean, Jesus was asleep <coughs> in the boat and there was a storm going on. So we, we can be at peace. I'm not suggesting you to freak out. But at the same time, um, if what I'm saying doesn't sit well with you, well, I'm sorry. You know, I, I believe what I'm telling you is the truth. And deal with it. Okay, Luke chapter 1, verse 80. Um, John the Baptist, it says, he grew and became strong in spirit. And he was in the deserts, in the wilderness, until the day of his appearing to Israel to commence his public ministry. 80. Okay, well now let's go to chapter 3. Because it, it says he was in the desert until his ministry began. And then his ministry began. In chapter 3, verse 2. It says... In the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. In other words, what he was saying, God gave him an unction to say. So, it's like what I'm saying, the message we have is, that I, you know, in other words, this is not my opinion. Okay, and I didn't get this from Fox News, and I didn't get this from brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. And I'm not saying that you can't listen to Fox News or you can't listen to brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. But I didn't get this from them. And if they're saying the same thing that I am, well, there's not some kind of conspiracy between us. They, they, got this, they have the same Holy Spirit I do, if that's where this is coming from, see. Okay, the Word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness, and he went into the country around about the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance, 
which means heartily amending your ways with abhorrence for past wrongdoing. Well, at least here in America, I don't see that happening. Now, I, I, is the message being preached? Well, I, I don't know. You know, I don't go quiz all the other pastors, all the other churches. Well, what are you preaching? You know, what's in, you know, I mean, I guess I could pull up their mission statement or something. And probably most of them say, well, you know, uh, you need to confess your sins before God and accept that Jesus shed his blood to save you from your sins or something to that effect. Okay, well, I mean, on the surface of it, that sounds like it's right. But there's something in the application of Christianity in America that is not bringing about a hearty amending of one's ways. Okay, and ab an abhorrent for their sins. Oh yeah, it's easy to abhor that person's sins over there. Ew. But how about abhorring your own sins? Uh, you, you know, you're not seeing, oh, no, that's, that's, uh, that's condemnation. And there is therefore now no condemnation. Well, wait a minute. We're not talking about condemnation. We're talking about abhorrence for sin. Right? There's a difference there. Okay? Um and forgiveness of sin. And I would say, if you're not really repentant, uh, you're not receiving forgiveness of sin. I'm not saying that Jesus didn't forgive you. Yeah, He forgave you whether you receive it or not. All right, He did that 2,000 years ago. There's nothing else God has to do to forgive your sins. That's paid for. But, but you know what? You hadn't even partaken of it if you're not ready to let those sins go. You know, say, well, I forgave you uh, uh, of this or that, and you're still doing the this or that. Well, then, you know, that shows that you're not even interested in receiving that. <laughs> right? Okay. As is written in the words of the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his beaten path straight. Every valley and ravine shall be filled up, and every mountain and hill shall be leveled. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places shall be made smooth. And all mankind shall see, understand, and acknowledge the salvation of God. Well, we haven't seen that yet. Now, that was John the Baptist's mission. Keep the place here in Luke. Go to Matthew chapter 11. His mission got cut short. He kind of did some, some things that got himself in trouble that I don't think God really wanted to happen. And he ended up getting thrown in prison and King Herod ended up having his head cut off. Well, that doesn't have to happen, but the threat of it was there, and I guess he just wasn't aware of how big of a threat that was to go uh, hang around with people in power like Herod. Anyway, but here in Matthew chapter 11, verse 7, um, Jesus is commenting on John the Baptist, and he says that after the men went their way, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John the Baptist. said, what did you go to the wilderness to see? A, re a reed swayed by the wind? What did you go to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in the houses of kings. Now, he... He's making a couple of analogies here in verse 7 and 8 that illustrate fragility or, or softness, right? I mean, the, the reed shaken by the wind, that's not a, an oak of righteousness, is it? See? And, and, okay. By him asking them this, he's pointing out something in their mindset that was wrong. In other words, in their minds... Uh, they, they thought that was a good way to be, would be to be a reed shaken in the wind, uh, or to be, uh, you know, clothed in the soft 
you know, velour, uh, you know, satin clothing. That, that, was, that was a great thing. And he was saying no. So that, that's, those are the ways of the world. It's the way of luxury and the way of, uh, you know, swaying whichever way the wind blows. That's, that's not, God doesn't want that in us. You know, he wants us, like I said, to be an oak of righteousness, not a, not a reed by, a, not a cattail by a pond. Okay, verse 9. So, what did you go to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you. And one that's out of the common, more eminent, more remarkable, and superior to a prophet. This is the one of whom it was written, I send my messenger ahead of you who shall make ready your way before you. And truly, I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist, yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And that could apply to us, you see. So, let, let's, let's try that prophetic mantle alone and see, try it on for size. Let, let's see what it would feel like to be John the Baptist. Let, let, let's, let's identify with that. Let, let's, let's embrace that role for ourselves, why don't we? Let, let, let's, let's take that challenge. Let's take the John the Baptist challenge. Let, you know, because Jesus said it. He said, hey, you can, be, you can be a better John the Baptist than John the Baptist was. Jesus said that. Do you, was, was he just blowing hot air? Or, or is that the truth? Well, let's give it a try. Why don't we? Okay? The Scripture, said, the scripture talks about this. I'm going to give you some examples. Go to uh, Revelation chapter 18. First of all, there's that thing about living in the wilderness. Why would one want to go live in the wilderness? Oh yeah, I know there's some people. Um, Ellen's niece had a boyfriend back in the, a few years back that, that had an island off the coast of Alaska. And he was just kind of a, I don't know, he was real different. He wanted to get away from society and so he bought an island off the coast of Alaska and, and he had no electricity and the only way to get there was a canoe and he built this house just out of the wood that he cut down in the forest and and he just he did everything himself I mean he was just a, a you know a mountain man you know that was just what he wanted to do so is that is that what God is saying that we are supposed to be no no, I mean, you could even say, well, that might, be a, that might be a metaphor for what God wants us to be. Well, okay, but it's in your heart. You know, we sing this song on Sunday, the road to Zion is in your heart. The business of being John the Baptist, of, of, of being in the wilderness, of coming out, it starts in your heart. It starts where you are dissatisfied with the status quo. If, if you are not happy with the culture that you find yourself planted in the middle of. If you're happy with it, then you're not John the Baptist. And, and God, Jesus said, hey, just the, the least, the most immature Christian that there is, is better off than John the Baptist. And John the Baptist came out. He came out of the, of the culture. And, and, and he had a message saying, repent. Okay, here's the way it is. The, here's the end time version of that. Revelation chapter 18, verse 1. Then I saw another angel descending from heaven, possessing great authority. And the earth was illuminated with his radiance and splendor. That's a big deal. Okay. And he shouted with a mighty voice saying, She has fallen. Mighty Babylon is fallen. Now Steve has talked about that on Friday night. And I think next time he ministers he may have some more to say about it. But she has become a resort and a dwelling place for demons. 
Hobbits. A dungeon haunted by every loathsome spirit. The abode for every filthy and detestable bird. And remember, Babylon is, is a metaphor for the world and its systems. Got some things to say about that here in a moment, but let's go on. For all nations have drunk the wine of her passionate unchastity, and the rulers and leaders of the earth have joined with her in committing fornication, and the businessmen of the earth have become rich with the wealth of her excessive luxury and wantonness. That's why Jesus was saying, hey, you're not going to find a John the Baptist wearing the, the rich uh, clothing, you know, right? Uh, and then I heard a voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so that you may not share in her sins, neither participate in her plagues. Can you say COVID? For her iniquities, her crimes and transgressions are piled up high as heaven. And God has remembered her wickedness and her crimes and is calling them up for settlement. Revelation chapter 12. This here in Revelation 12 actually goes with that admonition in Revelation 18 to come out. <clears throat> See, remember, the book of Revelation is not in chronological order. So it might talk about something in chapter 18 that it talks about in chapter 12, that it talks about in chapter 6, and, you know, it's, it's topical. Okay, and the topic we're talking about here is coming out. Right? Okay, Revelation 12. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon, under her feet, with a crown-like garland of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant, and she cried out in her birth pangs in the anguish of her delivery. And then another ominous sign was seen in heaven. Behold, a huge, fiery red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, seven kingly crowns upon his heads. His tail swept across the sky and dragged down a third of the stars flung them to the earth. And the dragon stationed himself in front of the woman who was about to be delivered so that he might devour her child as soon as she brought it forth. Well, there you have a picture of the church of Jesus Christ in this world today. The devil has the governments of men, which is that ten, ten heads and seven crowns and all of that stuff, and he's cast down all of these stars from heaven, which is the, the loathsome spirits that it talked about there in Revelation 18. This world is, is full of demonic operation. And, you know, we think demonic operation would be like a, a, a fun house at, at a carnival or something. No. Demonic operation is slick. Demonic operation is, uh, is hidden. It, it, it's, you, you, it, when it's done right, you won't even know it's going on until everything just falls apart. So how did that happen? Well, the devil was in the details. Okay, this is, this is where we find our... This is current events right here we're seeing in, in Revelation 12, 1 through 4. And then in verse 5 it says, And so she the church, brought forth the man-child, one who is destined to shepherd and rule all the nations with an iron staff. And her child was caught up to God into his throne. And the woman herself fled into the desert. See? She got out of town. She got out of Babylon where she has a place a retreat prepared for her by God in which she is to be fed and kept safe for 1260 days. <clears throat> now, I'm not saying that there is not a literal, tangible fulfillment for that verse. There is. I don't think that I could say it's just one place. But see, it's not, again, we're not talking about place here. We're not talking about geography. 
we're talking about a spiritual reality that we find ourselves in right now. And sooner or later, we're going to have to leave the system if we're going to be protected and kept safe by God. We're going we're to have to divorce ourselves from this world. We're going to have to get where this world and its systems do not control us, do not control our decisions or our behavior. We're not used to that. I don't think anybody's used to it really. <clears throat> but God always had his prophets come and bring that message. Not only John the Baptist. Go to Ezekiel chapter 12. Ezekiel 12, verse 1. And Ezekiel says, The word of the Lord came to me. See, I'm telling you folks. What I'm saying here, I believe is the word of the Lord that came to me. I, I, I think I am tasked by God to say these things. In other words, I'm not just... Um, you know, I just didn't wake up on the wrong side of the bed today and so I feel like having a rant about the way life in America is today. That's not what's going on here. I, I believe God has said, you got to get this point across. The world is going to hell in a handbasket and you're going to hell with it if you don't get out of the world. Right? I mean, you all see that, don't you? Okay. Okay. Um, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man... You dwell in the midst of a house of the rebellious who have eyes to see and see not, who have ears to hear and hear not, for they are a rebellious house. Therefore, son of man, prepare your belongings for removing and going into exile and move out by day in their sight. And you shall remove from your place to another place in their sight. And it may be that they will consider and perceive that they are a rebellious house. And you shall bring forth your luggage by day in their sight as baggage for removal into exile. And you shall go forth yourself at evening in their sight. Dig through the wall in their sight and carry the stuff out through the hole in their sight. You shall bear your luggage upon your shoulder and carry it forth in the dark, and you shall cover your face so that you cannot see the land, for I have set you as a sign for the house of Israel. Now there are several things about this that he's wanting the people to see. You know, he says this is a sign. In other words, this is, this is a, a metaphor. This is prophetic. It's symbolic. First of all, that they're leaving and then they're, they're taking their stuff with them. You know, in this world, I think they're going to invite you to, to leave and take your stuff with you. You know, that they're not going to want what the body of Christ has anymore. Now, we're not necessarily seeing this yet. This is prophecy because right now there are certain aspects of the world that seem to at least want us around so they can take our money so we can buy their products so they can still, you know, get rich at Walmart or wherever, right? But sooner or later when they've got all of their ducks in a row, they're not going to need us anymore and they're going to tell us, you know, uh, we don't need you, you know, sink or swim. Um, go to verse uh, 8. And in the morning came the word of the Lord to me, saying, Son of man, has not the house of Israel this rebellious house, ask, house asked, What are you doing? Well, say to them, Thus says the Lord God, This oracle or revelation concerns the prince in Jerusalem and all the house of Israel who are in it. Say, I am your sign, as I have done, so it shall be done to them. Into banishment and into captivity they shall go. 
You can either <coughs> flee to the wilderness where you will be fed and kept safe, or else you can be stuck in the, <coughs> in the midst of the town where there's chaos going on, and you're going to be running for your life, and you're going to be eating out of trash cans. Because the, the world system is not going to feed you. That is, unless you take the mark of the beast. And then you're damned eternally. What a choice. <laughs> Seriously. Um, Isaiah chapter 52. Verse 11. Depart. Depart. Go out from there. Touch no unclean thing. Go out of the midst of her. Cleanse yourself and be clean, you who bear the vessels of the Lord. See, we bear the vessels of the Lord. Uh, you know, we are the vessels of the Lord, right? You're, you are a temple of the Holy Spirit, it says in 1 Corinthians, right? So you are the vessel of the Lord. So... In your thinking, in your heart, you, you come out of the world so that you, your body, your, your life is spared. That's what he's telling you here. It says, for you will not go out with haste, nor will you go in flight. Now, in Revelation 12, the woman is going to go out in haste and she is going to go out in flight. But see, we don't have to go out that way. We can go out as the man-child. It's like we've, we've got that settled already. And if you've got it settled already, then God takes you on a business trip up to heaven and says, hey, I've got a new assignment for you. And he downloads you with that assignment and says, now you go back and you teach those other Christians who hadn't got what you got to get ready because Jesus is coming back and everything is going to be different. Everything. Okay. For you will not go out with haste, nor will you go by flight. For the Lord will go before you. The God of Israel will be your rear guard. Okay, Hebrews chapter 13. Now, I, I had a quandary here today as I was looking into these things, I was, I was thinking back. <clears throat> Do you all know, don't you, where the term the military-industrial complex came from? Okay, it came from President Dwight Eisenhower in his farewell address. His last, last uh, speech in office before John F. Kennedy became president in 1961. And he warned the American people about uh, the, uh, the combination of, of, of industry and business and uh, military um, establishment becoming too powerful, becoming their overreach, taking away the the freedoms of the American people. Now, this was Dwight Eisenhower now. This was not uh, Barack Obama. <laughs> okay, this was, this, was, this was the man who was the general of the Allied forces that beat the Nazis in World War II. He understands military. And if he was warning that it was not a good thing for the military and industry to get together and get too powerful, that that was going to end up taking away freedom, well, guess what, folks? It happened. And it didn't just happen with military. It happened with education. It happened with the media. It happened with medicine. It happened with banking. You know, there's the medical industrial complex. There's the educational industrial complex. There is the banking industrial complex, the media industrial complex. And it's the same folks at the top that control all of those things. And this is where it gets to the nitty-gritty for us. There is the evangelical Christian complex, industrial complex. 
There are those that are funding what the church does worldwide. And so, well, yeah, they're spreading the gospel. Well, that's the excuse given. And, and, you know, God will take advantage of any opportunity he has to save people. Make, Make no mistake. But that doesn't mean that everything the church has endeavored to do is because God wanted it done. A lot of it is done because the industrial complex who wants to control the military, wants to control banking, wants to control education, they want to control the church because they have an agenda to control the world. And they're going to fold the church into that world control just like they control the, the, the military or just like they control universities or Hollywood. And, and in Hebrews... 13 here, and you know, I I never really read it this way before. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 13, it says, Let us go forth from all that would prevent us to Jesus outside the camp, bearing the contempt and the abuse and the shame with him. Well, you know, I'd always read that, though, well, outside the camp. Well, yeah, we did that when we came to Jesus and we got born again. We came out, out of the world. No, that's not what this is saying. Because if you read it in the context, he talks about the, the children of Israel in the wilderness and the, the, uh, the sacrifices that were offered that Moses and the children of Israel offered in the wilderness. And it says that the bodies of the sacrifices were taken outside of the camp and burned. So the camp is not the world. The camp is the body of Christ. The camp is the religious industrial complex. That is the camp. The camp is the church, the world church. That's the camp he's telling us to come out of. And it's not just the Pope. And it's not just the Baptists or the Methodists. It's all of it when it's, when it's controlled and run by the industrial complex, by the money that runs the whole thing, by the businessmen of the earth that have grown wealthy from Babylon and the harlot. We're to come out of that. We're not to identify ourselves with that. Because if we do, we're still in the camp. That's the camp. And it says when you come out of that, you will have contempt, abuse, and shame heaped on you. Y'all have had these conversations with people about, well, where do you go to church? And you say, well, how many people go to your church? And how many people got saved there last Sunday? And, you know, uh, how many TV stations are you on? Right? Right? And, uh, you know, how many people are on, are on your, your praise band? And, and et cetera. So how, many, how many records has your worship leader put out? Uh, no, those are, listen, those are valid questions for some churches out there. They, they do that. That's part of their world. Now, are, are the people doing is that, does mean, does that mean they're all Satan worshipers and they're just faking? No. They are part of the church that are being brought into the evangelical industrial complex to do all of that. Right? And if you say, no, we're not doing that. We don't think that's right. Well, they're going to have contempt for you. They're going to put shame. Oh, you know, you must be a cult then. Well, well, you know, how, how come you're not out there following the Great Commission? Right? What's wrong with you? You know, there, there must be something wrong with you because, you know, if you were doing it right, they'd be breaking down the door to come to your church. <coughs> well, that's baloney because they're not breaking down the, the door to go to those churches either. They're, they're scrambling trying to get people to come, but they have a better marketing plan than we do, I'll have to say. Okay. It says, verse 14, For here we have no permanent city. But we are looking for the one which is to come. Right? 
We're strangers and we're, we're sojourners and pilgrims in this world. Now, you know, you may think, well, right, you're being kind of harsh on the church world. Okay, maybe I am, but let me give you this while we're at it. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Let me tell you why it's important that you not get too cozy with the rest of, of what calls itself Christian. I'm not saying that we have to totally disavow everything that calls itself Christian. And, you know, you can... Uh, hey, a broken clock is right twice a day. I mean, you can, you can gain truth from people who are in error about this over here. You know, well, that, that guy's not, he's not even spirit-filled. Well, maybe that is a problem, but if he's talking about something else and it's true, hey, you know, I agree with that. Okay? And, and uh, you know, the, these people over here, they're talking about, ah, well, we know that's not the way it is. Well, maybe it is that way. But what you do have to watch out for is when you are being played, when, when you are being manipulated. And it talks about that here in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 19. It says, For you readily and gladly bear with the foolish, since you are so smart and so wise yourself. For you endure it, if a man assumes control of your souls and makes slaves of you. You know, there's a lot of ways in which that happens. And generally speaking, there's money involved. There has to be money involved for that to, to, to function in, in this world today. Okay, I mean, there is a, such a thing that we call charisma. You know, that somebody is just has such a magnetic personality that, you know, people will just do everything he wants to be done. And yes, you have to, you have to be careful about that. But, you know, money talks. And, and success seems to attract. You know, in fact, this is, this is um, you know, this is a, a, a theory that a lot of churches go with it, that excellence attracts excellence. That you know the the more the more uh, you know pizzazz you have, the more attractive you're going to be. You know the more you're spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, but it could be something else going on. It could be that you are being brought under control for your money, and they make slaves of you, and they devour your substance and spend your money and they prey upon you, or deceive, or take advantage of you, or they're arrogant and put on airs, or strike you in the face. Well, see, this is why it would be a good idea at some point to get outside the system, because you don't want to be played. You don't want to be taken advantage of. Now, I'm not talking about giving to the Lord of your tithes and offerings because you believe what the Word says, that, you know, that, that given it will be given to you, pressed down and shaken together and running over. I'm talking about where, you are, where your um, fleshly desires are, are being manipulated so that they can use you as part of building their kingdom. You know, Romans 8 doesn't have much of a kingdom. I mean, I won't say we don't have any at all. Well, I mean, we're not just paupers out there on the street. But um, it, it's piddly compared to most of what is called church in America today. And you know, I've come to realize that that's not something to be ashamed of. Go to Galatians chapter 4. And in verse 8, it says, At the previous time, when you had not come to be acquainted with and understand and know the true God, you Gentiles 
were in bondage to gods that who by nature could not be gods at all. Well, of course, the Greeks had all the, you know, their whole pantheon of gods, you know, Bacchus and Zeus and Apollo and Diana and all of those, right? And that's just one example. Every, every culture out there has its gods. You know, it, it, it's like Blaise Pascal said, uh, everybody has a, uh, an empty place within that they want to fill with something. And if they don't fill it with God, they'll, they'll make a God of something else to put in there. You know, that it could be alcohol. It could be football. It could be uh, music. Right? I mean, people, people have that, that, that they, they will be, they will want to be um, part of something greater than themselves. And that is not necessarily a bad thing, Except what is that thing that you're wanting to be part of that's greater than yourself? See, and that he was, he's pointing this out, that, that they in Galatia had that tendency just like every human being everywhere does. But verse 9 he says, But now that you have become acquainted with and understand and know the true God, how can you then turn back to the weak and beggarly and worthless elementary things uh, whose slaves you once more want to become. Now the irony here in Galatia is that, okay, they, they were pagans, they were Greeks, and they worshipped these gods, and okay, and then they got born again, and then some, some Judaizing teachers came along and said, oh no, you need to, you know, Hebrew roots, you need to get back under the law, and so they did that. But see, getting back under the law is not the only weak and beggarly thing that people can put there instead of the, the true knowledge of a relationship with God through the Holy Spirit. That was just what they fell into. So people can fall into all kinds, fall back into all kinds of things that are essentially idolatry. People can put a preacher there and it's still idolatry. I was reading a thing today about a preacher, and most of y'all don't know him, but, I, but it's beside the point. I mean, it could be anybody uh, who, who had a mega church in, uh, in Seattle. And a number of years back, they fired him because of, of uh, spiritual abuse. And you'd think, well, you know, maybe he kind of learned his lesson and and repented of, of being, you know, uh, a dominating, controlling person. But no, he got involved in another mega church in another city, and the same stuff is going on there. See, so it's idolatry. It's not, it's not just, uh, you know, legalism. It's not just wanting to be back under the, the Old Testament. I mean, you could have uh, lawlessness. You could have, um, you know, free thinking in there, and that could be an idol too. You know, anything that you have there that is taking the place that God should take, this applies. And see, it's, it's an indication, if you read in the context of Galatians 4, it's an indication of being immature. Immature Christians are going to do this. It says, in verse 3, it says, When we were minors, we were kept as slaves under the rules of ritual, and, and subject to the elementary teachings and systems of external observances and regulations. And, you know, I mean, to some extent that is unavoidable. You know, we were taught, well, you should confess the word. You know, if you're sick, you should say this. And, you know, and you, when, when, when you're, uh, you know, if your back hurts, then you should put your legs out there and ask somebody to, to, to lengthen them or something. Well, this is how you do it. And we didn't know any better, so okay, that's how we did it. And God came through for us, didn't he? But if, if you just want to stay there, and then you just want some other minister to tell you what you're supposed to do, you are an immature Christian. And you are going to be taken advantage of. You are going to be played by the evangelical industrial complex. 
and you're going to end up running from the Antichrist in this world. You may not even find your way into the wilderness. You may not even believe there is a wilderness to go to. Right? Just saying. Luke chapter 21. Verse 12, previous to this, they will lay hands on you and persecute you, turning you over to synagogues. Hmm, that's a religious gathering place, to synagogues and prisons. Of course, this all happened back during the first century too, so I'm not necessarily putting a time stamp on this, but let's see what Jesus says about this synagogues and prisons, and you will be led away before kings and governors for my name's sake. Well, yeah, they, they hauled Peter and James and John and Paul before governors and kings and whatnot. Well, okay, they did, and that happened back then. But see, it, it's the situation and not just the timing that we're looking at here. It says, this will be an opportunity for you to bear testimony Resolve and settle it in your minds not to meditate or prepare beforehand how you would make your defense or you will answer. Yeah, I mean, you know, that would be my temptation. Well, suppose they did haul me before uh, Judge Clay Jenkins. What would I say? It's like, well, you know what? You probably can't think through that one. You're probably just going to have to depend upon the Holy Spirit. And that's what he says. Resolve and settle it in your minds because I myself will give you a mouth and such utterance and wisdom that all your foes combined will not be able to stand against or to refute. You will be delivered and betrayed even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends. And some of you they will put to death. And they did. Still happens. You will be hated by everyone because you bear my name and for its sake. But not a hair on your head shall perish by your steadfastness and patient endurance. See, verse 19 tells you how verse 18 is going to happen. Is, is we've got to be patient and we've got to have steadfastness. We can't be a reed shaken by the wind. We can't be in soft raiment. We're going to have to be tough. Our, our, our Spiritual life is going to have to be steadfast. And it says, by that you will win the true life of your soul. 1 Peter chapter 4. Verse 12, Beloved, do not be amazed and bewildered at the fiery ordeal which is taking place to test your quality, as though something strange and unusual and alien to you and your position was befalling you. Now that can take a lot of different forms. Now, in the context here of these verses and in the context of what I've been talking about tonight, we seem to be talking about persecution, I guess I would say. But the point I'm making is that we go through trials in this life. There's stuff that's hard to deal with and hard to bear. There, you know, it's not, it's not all fun and games. It's not easy. We, we are confronted with things that are difficult. And he's saying here, don't think that, don't let the devil tell you that there's something wrong with you and that's why all of this stuff is happening. Keep the place here and go to John chapter 15. If you belong to God, 
if you have given your heart and life to Jesus, you have a bullseye painted on your back. Uh, that's a good thing. Because otherwise, the devil would have you in his net. You know, he'd be hauling you in like a fish. Uh, John chapter 15, 15, verse 18 says, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet, because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, the world hates you. Right? Okay, so it's, he's, he's said it's going to be that way. So, even if our trials don't have anything to do with persecution, they're still, they're still training us to be uh, hardened to difficulties. First uh, Peter chapter 4, verse 13. And insofar as you are sharing Christ's suffering, rejoice, so that when His glory is revealed, you may also rejoice with triumph. And if, verse 14, And if you are censured and suffer abuse because you bear the name of Christ, blessed are you, happy and fortunate to be envied, because the Spirit of God, the Spirit of glory, is resting on you. On your part, on, his, on their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. Verse 17. For the time has arrived for judgment to begin with the household of God. See, it's been going on. I mean, it, it's been going on since the first century. This is, this is kind of my point here. The things that Jesus talked about there in Luke 21, they started then and they, they've carried right on up until now. So the trials we're going through, it, it's just an unbroken line from the first century until now. You know, it, and the devil wants to tell you that, well, you know, you're just, you just missed out. You know, you just... You know, you're just messed up. Everybody else is going the right way and you just got left behind. Well, that's garbage. What you're going through is what the church goes through and what Jesus said the church is going to go through. It's part of our, it's part of our walk, in other words. See, you're not going to hear this everywhere because... You know, this doesn't recruit a lot of, uh, of uh, people to want to sign up for that. But, you know, consider the alternative. You're, you're going you're gonna to let the devil be your master. You're going you're gonna to do what he says, and you'll end up taking his mark and going to hell forever. No. Now, see, that requires some faith. That requires some, some getting out of the, 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 the present here and now physical realm and being able to see beyond what your senses tell you to realize that there is a higher, greater spiritual reality that, that we are, that everybody is actually a part of, whether they realize it or not. Um, the time has arrived for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the end of those who do not respect and believe or obey the good news of the gospel? And if the righteous are barely saved, what will become of the godless and the wicked? You know, this is so different than the perception that you could have if you just walk into Walmart or you just go anywhere in public, you know, and everybody's just going about their business and, you know, people are buying this and they're putting gas in their car and they're, they're listening to their earbuds or they're doing whatever they're doing and it's like, Everybody's just going their merry way. And it's like, you know, and, and we're, we're under attack from the devil. And it's like, you know, it, it makes you feel like you're an alien. It, you, it makes you feel like you're a, a sojourner. It makes you feel like a pilgrim. It makes you feel like, hey, I don't belong here. 
Well, duh! That's the whole point. <coughs> you don't. We're not supposed to fit in here. We're, we're, we're a, a square peg trying to be crammed into a round hole. That, that doesn't work. You, you're going to get... You're going to get your arms cut off trying to do that. Okay? Verse 18. Therefore, those who are ill-treated and suffered in accordance with God's will must do what is right and commit their souls as a charge to the one who created them and will never fail them. We're going to get through this thing. We're going, we're going to be, one way or the other, there, there would be no reason, there would be no trial, no nothing, no government edict, no, no mandate um, that could keep us from being prepared, for going to that place that's prepared for us where we're fed and kept safe. There is nothing the devil can do to keep that from happening except us except us just not going there, except us just not, not saying, oh, well, I don't want to do that. I mean, I'm comfortable here. Think about the Jews in Europe in the 1930s, or even before that. I mean, uh, anti-Semitic persecution of the Jews didn't start in the 1930s, but it kind of reached a crescendo under Hitler and under Stalin, too. But point being... The, the handwriting was on the wall, and uh, if they had any, uh, you know, any awareness of what was going on, the right thing to do would have been to get out of Europe. But no, they were comfortable there. They had a good life. They had businesses, you know, and they were well-respected citizens in their community, and they had lots of money, and so they didn't want to leave Europe. So they ended up in Auschwitz and, and Dachau and some of these other places, naked, gassed in a gas chamber, and their bodies burned. See, that's the way the world system does to you, if, if you let it. And that does not have to happen to us. There's, there's some voices out there in the body of Christ, oh yeah, you know, uh, martyrdom is the greatest thing that can happen to you. Well, okay, you know, they, the, they, those that are martyred, it says they will rule and reign with Christ too. But that's not the only way you get to rule and reign with Christ. The man-child wasn't martyred. The man-child, it says, he was caught up. He was harpazoed. He was, he was uh, snatched away from the situation. You know, God can snatch us away from bad situations. Uh, he's done it for me time and time again. I know he's done it for you all too. So, Father, get us ready. Help us to see our relationship to this world for what it really is and not to, not to be lulled by a false sense of security, by not, not to let... The, the grace that we have through Jesus Christ um, convince us that, that we don't have to come out of this world's systems or, or that, that we don't have any uh, responsibility to, to seek you in, in a deeper, more profound way. And help us to recognize when we're being played by the church system and, and by the, all of the world systems, all, all of the industrial complexes that are out of there. Because we know that's your intention. And you said that you would do that work in us right up until the day of Jesus' return. And, and we want that work to be done. And so I say, Lord Jesus, even so, do it. And we'll give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen.